Coming up on DTNS, it's WWDC 2021. There's a lot of news. We're going to do our best to break it down. There's other news, too, plus announcements from this year's WWDC show. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 7th, 2021. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us today, we have Terrence Gaines and Nika Montford, the hosts of the Snob OS podcast. Hello. How are you both doing? Good. Glad to be back. Got a lot We're to back. talk about today. Yep. Well, it is just kind of the perfect day <laughs> for both of you. I've, I was watching uh, you both on Twitter, taking your own notes, doing some live tweeting. Uh, WWDC, of course, especially when you do anything that's Apple-focused. We're certainly Apple-focused to a point here on DTNS, but the Stop OS podcast, um, it's definitely in your wheelhouse. So really great to have both of you. Uh, we are going to get into as much of the WWDC details as we can fit into one show in just a few minutes. Uh, before the show, we were talking on Good Day Internet, yeah, just about uh, a little bit about WWDC and what we sort of liked and didn't like. But we also talked about Haunted Lakes. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about that wider conversation, you could do so by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few non-WWDC tech things you should know. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that the company will continue to not charge fees for its paid online events, fan subscriptions, and badges through 2023, and will include its upcoming news products in that no-fee policy as well. No word on what the rate will be after 2023, but if there's any question why Facebook is doing this, Zuck said, when we do introduce a revenue share, it will be less than the 30% that Apple and others take. Zing. <laughs> Singapore-based Flex, the world's third biggest largest chip manufacturer, expects chip shortages to continue. Flex's chief procurement and supply chain officer, Lynn Terrell, says, with such strong demand, the expectation is mid to late 2022, depending on the commodity. Some are expected into 2023. Chip makers continue to invest in new production capacity, but new facilities are not yet complete. The California Public Utilities Commission issued a permit to GM's autonomous vehicle subsidiary, Cruise, allowing the company to shuttle passengers in its test vehicles without a human safety operator. Cruise is the first company to get the permit in the state and cannot charge uh, fares for rides in test AVs. Nine companies, including Cruise, have previously obtained driverless test permits from the California DMV that's different from the Public Utilities Commission, although Neuro remains the only company to have obtained a commercial deployment permit from the DMV. YouTube Shorts, still in beta and previously available in the U.S. and India, is now expanding to the U.K., Canada, and Latin America. Users will now be able to use music from YouTube's wider catalog, add captions and overlays on shorts, color correct, and sample audio from other shorts. Sounds familiar. Hmm. And Google reached a settlement with France's competition authority over charges that it abused its dominant online ad position by favoring its own advertising services to the detriment of rivals. The company agreed to pay a 220 million euro fine and pledged to improve interoperability between its ad manager and third party ad servers. The changes stem from a 2019 complaint filed by News Corp and the French newspaper Le Figaro. All right, before we get into some WWDC news, we did have a pretty big story over the weekend that, that spins a tale of sorts about two different national approaches to cryptocurrency. In a broadcast at the Bitcoin 2021 conference, El Salvador's president, Nayib Bukele, announced that he will send a bill to the country's Congress to make Bitcoin a legal tender. Currently, the U.S. dollar is legal tender in the country. El Salvador will partner with the digital wallet company Strike to build out Bitcoin financial infrastructure. Strike first launched its mobile payments app in the country back in March, quickly becoming El Salvador's most downloaded app. So there's some demand there. El Salvador largely operates as a cash economy with about 70% of the population without bank accounts or credit cards. One would think ripe for cryptocurrency to be adopted in possibly mass numbers. Currently, about 20% of the country's GDP comes from remittances sent home from migrants abroad and Bitcoin transfers for these would avoid international transfer fees. 
or, you know, that would be something that could be sold to a person who's thinking about getting into this. Meanwhile, China continues to crack down on Bitcoin trading and mining as many cryptocurrency related accounts on Weibo were blocked over the weekend with more actions expected to come in line with the country's criminal law. Access to banned accounts was denied with a message saying that they violate laws and rules. Hmm. It's a little bit of a general thing, but that's what it said. China's central bank development of its own develop is developing its own digital currency and is continuing to do so. Yeah, and they're they're trialing that uh, on some limited basis to kind of get a feel for how that's going to fall. And I think a lot uh, this this is Bitcoin news uh, out of El Salvador. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people saw. Okay, you know, uh, when Bitcoin first got started, there was a lot of speculation of, oh, you know, what's the what's the future of currency going to be? Um, you know, we've we've seen various businesses and and industries, you know, kind of uh, varyingly adopt different types of cryptocurrency. Bitcoin certainly prominent in that group. Um, but I, you know, I think for a, for a lot of speculation was, okay, so this is showing, you know, uh, having this decentralized approach, being able to avoid some of these gatekeepers and stuff like that. This paves the way maybe for a digital currency, obviously what China is doing right now, the US, Great Britain, uh, the EU is also all looking into this. Uh, what El Salvador is doing, I, I mean, when you look at that 20% of GDP, some of these fees that come from uh, these remittance international transfers can be up to 10%. So you're looking at something that this could be like, you know, if, if this seems mass adoption, and given that you know the 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 app that's backing the strike, it, you know is is very popular in the country, it could be a not insignificant boost to their GDP just by this simple move. Um, you know, uh, so it it will be it will be interesting to see how they lay that financial infrastructure and are able to uh, if this is actually able to to help uh, people you know get, kind of get more advanced, uh, I guess money transfer services. I, you know, I, I uh, it, it would it would still be an un, you know largely unbanked. Uh, population, but what kind of difference that could make? Yeah, so guess, yeah, no kidding. Well, I guess my question would be real fast: is how uh, developed is El Salvador to where the majority of people don't have bank accounts? Is there a learning curve when it comes to Bitcoin? Is that something they're going to have to overcome in order to do this? Because that seems like a big learning curve. Again, I'm not familiar with El Salvador like that, but are they technologically advanced to where they can jump on this fast enough to be able to take advantage to where it could add to their GDP? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not uh, never having been there. I'm not much of an expert myself, uh, but I kind of liken it to the idea of, oh well, you know, if you if you're you're mostly dealing with cash, you know, whether it's going in or uh, or coming in or going out, um, and you know, not banking, so not doing a lot of online banking. So you think like, well, there's you know possibly you know uh, a lot of adoption of home computers yet to be had. But if you can access an app that doesn't require Any to have a bank account and you're skipping on some fees, it's almost like, you know, folks that jump to the smartphone life without having the computer first type of a thing. It's right. probably the adoption is probably pretty darn easy, you know, because okay. money's money. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. To the to the point where banking might look like, well, that's the old way of doing things, but it's sure a lot more complicated than what we're being sold. Yeah, why, why crawl when you can fly? I got you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we've seen curb displays and foldable displays on consumer electronics for a few years now, certainly prototypes and definitely now uh, uh, things we can actually buy. And we've seen rollable displays on the horizons, if CES is any indication. Now Samsung showed off a prototype of a stretchable OLED display that can be stretched in all directions like rubber bands, according to the company. The display is able to stretch using a specially designed elastomer treated to resist the heat of the electronics with a grid-like island structure. The current prototype can be stretched up to 30% while operating normally, able to be stretched up to 1,000 times. That's just for this prototype, and that's the extent of which they've tested, and it still responds normally. Samsung published a proof of concept showing the display used as a stretchable heart rate monitor about the size of a Band-Aid. It literally just looks like a Band-Aid with a display on it. Uh, kind of uh, interesting. Samsung sees this display as having uh, numerous applications in healthcare tech. And, you know, just just kind of on that Band-Aid uh, design alone, we've seen uh, certainly some kind of wearable tech that's a little bit more passive, right, that has some sort of uh, like chemical receptors that can then send some information to a smart device. But having that display on there, uh, I could see a lot of wearable and, and definitely healthcare tech uh, applications of this. Uh, Sarah, are you going to be getting uh, your stretchable display if it's available? 
Oh, well, okay. So we've got, you know, yeah, curved displays, rollable displays. Sure. Seems cool. No real, you know, the uh, precious few products, um, you know, to, 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 to speak for, for all of these prototypes that we keep seeing. However, the stretchable thing, yeah, if, it, if you're talking about like, I don't know, something that's tablet-like, I'd be like, nah, that's silly. But yes, anything that would be a wearable, for example, the smartwatch that I use, it gets really finicky about uh, about giving me an accurate heart rate. You know, if I'm doing jumping jacks and it's like, oh, it's like, you know, you're at 85. I'm like, ah, it's not working right. Like it's not sitting on me properly. You know, it's either too tight or too loose. Something that's a little bit more, you know, a second skin w would be a, a great a great use for this. You mentioned the Band-Aid. It's like, yeah, okay, something like that. You know, not necessarily just on humans, but but something that a piece of technology that can that can stretch and be sort of flush with whatever surface it's it's kind getting of like data the off of. Kind of like the tape that you know you see yeah. athletes kind of tape all over their body because I, <laughs> apparently that does something to the muscles if they <laughs> can like, like put it. some kind of tech <laughs> inside of the the tape, then I think that would probably be a to me a better benefit of any type of stretchy type device. Yeah, the the problem that it seems like Samsung is having is they still need to retain like a tiny non-stretchable part to kind of put all of the electronics in. Like it seems like yeah. relatively they have the display component at least in in a prototype figured out whether it'll actually get to production, but it's like, it's getting those like kind of hard, uh, hard, you know, unbendable electronics. We've, we've certainly seen that in, uh, in foldables uh, as well. That's kind of the limiting factor right now. So, uh, you know, we will see, in fact, uh, you know, last year, I, I think uh, uh, South Korea kind of commissioned LG to kind of take over development of this as kind of the next frontier. It's interesting that Samsung uh, has now kind of come out and is, is showing off some stuff now, although admittedly it was like a render. So we will see if, when, when that uh, comes to life. Well, if you'd like us to talk about stretchy tech, rollable <laughs> tech, or anything on the show, one way to let us know is by submitting stories in our subreddit and voting on others so they rise to the top. Submit stories, vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Okie dokie, WWDC 2021, uh, the keynote, which was pre-packaged, uh, as Apple has been doing um, since, you know, pandemic times uh happened earlier today although as you as i did notice they had the you know memoji crowd and as if tim cook was in an event space so i feel like they're inching back to wanting to make this an in-person event again i thought that was kind of clever but we have lots of stuff to cover so we're going to do our best to get through them nika and terrence you're going to help make some sense of all of this for us but ios we'll start with ios uh the 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 show kicked off with Kind of a big, splashy set of updates for FaceTime. Uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, spatial audio was 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 one of the first um, one of the, one of the first things that 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 FaceTime will get with the assumption that people are using FaceTime the way that they are using Zoom or Skype or all sorts of things where we're we're in video chats together. And spatial audio will help you feel more than ever like you're in a room with folks. Background noise suppression if you're in a loud place, or if you want to bring in the background noise when you're in a place. That, those are things that uh, FaceTime is going to add. Portrait mode with a background blurred uh, to kind of make it look, I don't know, more portraity. That's sort of nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned uh, Zoom calls, FaceTime links. Um, it ma makes makes appointment FaceTimes uh, a lot more like you know a more like corporate Zoom call where you can generate a link, plan ahead, send those links. Um, those links can open in web browsers uh, as well as mobile devices. So that's kind of cool. And uh, SharePlay lets you listen to stuff uh, on Apple Music within a FaceTime call. So there's, you know, there's some there's some interrupt stuff going on. You could also watch a video uh, in a FaceTime call, which then gets into watch content with your friends on a FaceTime call. Uh, and third-party apps, certain uh, third-party apps will be able to take advantage of SharePlay as well. For example, you could, we could all here on the show, uh, fire up a, you know, something on Disney Plus and co-watch together, you know, as long as, as long as we're subscribers. Terrence and Nika, what a FaceTime, whether I mentioned it or not, jumped out to you the most. 
Well, you mentioned it. Uh, they're trying to be what people are doing on Zoom, especially with the FaceTime links to be able to schedule a FaceTime versus just scheduling however you schedule it. Everybody get on that call or that at that time and say, okay, well, let me then start FaceTime. It's already pre-started. So uh, all these plays specifically with Face, FaceTime specifically are, okay, Apple wants to get in front of that uh, uh, work play, you know, do everything in FaceTime versus it just being something that you do with your kids or your kids do, you know, this is actually grown up time, put on your big boy pants and now let's get into the, try to get into the office so we can actually look more professional. And the fact that they're allowing it across platform, it's not, the link will work not just with iOS devices, but with Android and with other devices as well. I think they are really trying to find their space in the whole, um, you know, virtual type meeting space. So for the most part, I think that's what they're doing with FaceTime and giving you the spatial audio. So it gives you more of a feel that you're actually in the same room with the person. So it's not so flat to seeing so much as a more of a robotic type of, of interaction. It kind of gives you the feel of being in the same room with someone. Yeah, that's a really good, a really good point of non iOS people being able to join a FaceTime call, you know, to be invited to one. Um, I was listening to a podcast over the weekend, just, you know, what to expect from WWDC, you know, as <laughs> everybody had those over the weekend, but, uh, but yeah, what one of the one of the folks who was on a particular podcast was like, yeah, I don't live in the U.S. I mean, the whole like messages and FaceTime stuff. It's not just iOS specific, but there are so many other options depending on where you live that a lot of this just seems like it's this very insular world that so many people are not a part of. And I know Apple knows that. So to be able to to open up uh, something that is clearly popular with iOS users to others is 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 a big thing. Uh, also in iOS, a uh, lot of notification updates. You've got focus mode that goes beyond do not disturb where someone would get an indication like, oh, she doesn't just have you know the whole system off. Uh, there's something that Sarah is doing so that she can't get back to you right away. So it's a little bit more context as to why you might text somebody and, and, and they don't respond, um, whether it's going to be for a while or the whole night or or if they're just doing something else, uh, better notification summaries. So when you're looking at your notifications and a bunch of apps have given you a lot of stuff, you get a little bit more context on what those notifications have. Photos now include live text. Uh, this is kind of neat, uh, allowing you to highlight text that's in a photo um, and using a little, uh, yeah, a, a little AI to be able to, to to give you that text and you could copy and paste it somewhere else. Um, I believe that they mentioned on stage that that would be in seven different languages. Uh, in, in images as well, the uh, idea to attach songs uh, from Apple Music, of course, to add to photos memories. I'm like, uh, photo memories are already so dangerous. <laughs> you know, Not only are you gonna show me a picture of my ex-boyfriend, but that song we broke up to, no thank you. Uh, <laughs> but I thought that this, the, the the uh, announcement in in the Apple Wallet, which Wallet is, I don't know, I feel like it's, there have been so many missed opportunities for Wallet as of late, but Apple mentioned uh, keys, corporate badges, hotel room keys, uh, keys for smart home locks, all able to be stored in Wallet. Also, identity cards, a digital photo ID can be in your Apple Wallet, something that, um, I mean, I think would be could be uh, replacing your ID going through an airport, for example. Kind of, they they kind of threw that in there like it wasn't a big deal, but that jumped out at me as like a pretty big deal. No, it yeah, is it's, a big deal. It, yeah, go ahead, Terrence, because no, that's one of the things on your. Is the <laughs> well, because I I mean I dream of the day we can get rid of a wallet. You know, there are frequent times where I'm walking around the neighborhood, and since I've got. Since I've got an Apple Watch that's got the cellular, I can play my podcasts on here, I can do all the things, I can get in and out of my house. But the one thing I can't do is, you know, put my ID on my watch. And I would think it would be a nice way to be able to put my ID on my watch because, you know, just as a black man out there, I don't want to leave the house without my ID. So the ability to be able to just have my phone with me and then know that I have some form of identification on my phone is a big deal for me. Yeah, yeah sure. and I think, and and they mentioned, I think coming down the pipeline is 
for TSA for be for you to be able to get through TSA. I don't know if it's specifically if you have like global entry or like your passport, but you're going to be able to add not only like your driver's license, but other identification if you are, you know, in the airport trying to go somewhere. And I think trying to get away from like physical items, because I know I'm mostly digital. I, I really don't like dealing with like paper. And as much as I can, if I can put it on my phone to scan, to go to the grocery store, to go to the airport or whatever the case may be, to just have everything, you know, in my phone, because I'm nine times out of 10, I'm going to have my phone on me or my watch on me. So to be able to have that type of identification, you know, on your physical person, not something you actually have to carry that's separate. I think that's, I think that's a pretty big game changer that they did. Like you said, Sarah, kind of gloss over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely, I, you know, I, I, I felt as though if there were a crowd, there would have been some gasps kind of thing. Like, Ooh, this is pretty cool. But you know, alas, we're all at home. Uh, a few more, a few more announcements in iOS, uh, weather got new dynamic designs, maps get, gets new detailed 3d views in certain cities, uh, you know, rolling out slowly, but maps continues to, to get better, but over on iPad OS side, uh, we got something called Shelf. It's a new way to multitask, uh, split screen options within apps. If you're, if you've got a an app and a shelf, it's. I guess I, if I understand this correctly, and I haven't used iPad OS uh, regularly uh, as as a productivity tool in some time, but it's sort of fast app switching, but it's more like a dock. So we've got. Yet, yet closer, the iPad OS and the Mac OS operating systems inching closer together. Not exactly, but they're getting there. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely, because you can definitely do that on a Mac. You can have the desktops, what they call it in Macs, where you can swipe between the desktops and however you have your desktop set up. You know, in my case, a lot of times when I'm working on our show, I'll have Safari and Docs next to each other, but I can just swipe to another desktop and have something totally different. Well, this kind of does that. So they're trying to play into that, you know, even more so iPad can, in fact, be a, a full production multitasking tool. So this is just another way to try to push that point. Yeah, and I think it was very interesting that he brought up specifically podcasts. So he had like one side of the screen was like a podcast and one side was kind of a doc. So um, it's like, you know, instead of having a full on production to record a podcast or a web show, you can actually do that from your from your iPad. You have the video screen, you have you know the audio portion of it. So yeah, I think I thought I think it was a very calculated point of them, you know, specifically mentioning a podcast. And what's interesting about that the the concept of the shelf is that it helps finally kind of deal with the fact that iPad OS is a windowed operating system. Like we've all we've had the the split screen uh, uh, and the desktop um, uh, concepts around for quite a, for a little bit now. But the fact that like when you open the, one of the examples they showed is that when you open a mail app, that mail pane is kind of opened in its own window that's on top of the mail that that like is existing on top of kind of everything else. And the shelf is kind of designed to okay, here's how we deal with that so that it is tied to mail because that's where you're going to want to access it. But if you don't want that up, you can you can take that away. You know, the, people have kind of some people have criticized iPadOS for maybe moving a little slow for in, in terms of uh, building these elements. But you know, the, I think this is a is a very big step for you know if you want to be kind of iPad only, this kind of window management, as rudimentary as it may be, is a big step. Uh, yeah. So there. Well, we'll get to it in a minute. Universal control, which which does bring the iPad uh, into into the Mac universe even more with Mac OS Monterey. But uh, before we move on from iPad OS, uh, bigger widgets on the home screen. Quick notes for iPad OS and and Mac OS. So it's the Notes app, but again, more context richer. Uh, and developers can build apps with Swift playgrounds, essentially just making it easier to 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 work on building apps. Uh, those of those of the developers who already do so say, oh, this is easier. Maybe there are others who just never got their feet wet in the first place who might want to take a swing. So that's pretty cool. Privacy. Apple Apple was a bit heavy handed with <laughs> privacy. That's Apple's thing these days. We would expect nothing less. Uh, but uh, quite a few privacy features that they went through, such as being able to hide your IP address uh, when you're sending an email so that the recipient can't do things like, you know, 
uh, track you or if you if you if you get an email rather to be able to know when you opened it, that sort of thing. Hiding your IP address uh, when you are visiting sites in Safari. Um, uh, providing a new app privacy report so folks can see how often apps are using your location, your mic, uh, searching your contacts, um, uh, uh, you know, using your camera. This is all happening every seven days. And this is if you grant an app permission to do so. So Apple is saying, well, first of all, if you don't grant permission, you don't have to worry about apps being able to access any of the stuff. But if you do, we're still going to give you the information on how this is being used so then you can you know, reassess at a later time if that's exactly what you want the app to be doing. Uh, Siri on device processing not only makes uh, a lot of queries faster, but gives you more privacy because your question isn't going out anywhere, it's on device. Uh, there's a recovery contact list uh, for forgotten passwords. So if I, I don't know, I'm really shut out, I might say, well, Nika's is on my trusted list. I can give her a call and get my information that way. Uh, a new digital legacy program, uh, if you are, <laughs> well, this is something that you would think about before you pass away, but it is de it's designed for your loved ones to be able to deal with what your digital life was, uh, what whatever state they want it to be in, um, in the event of your passing. And we got iCloud Plus, which uh, includes hide my email. You know, if you're signing up for a newsletter and you just don't want uh, that that email address of yours to get out there. It's a way to obfuscate, but to, 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 to get that information to your actual email address, private uh, relay for encrypted web searches, uh, home kit video support. Okay. Rich privacy. Uh, I know you care about privacy. <laughs> what, 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 what felt like lip service here and what felt pretty cool from Apple? Uh, I think the app privacy report is super interesting because previously it's kind of an all or I mean, even though they do give you very granular controls, you know, whether the mic, you can access some photos, location. Once you've kind of enabled that, it was, you know, you, you kind of just like, okay, I guess this app just forever has this and maybe I'll turn off location services if I feel uncomfortable. Getting that report seems really great. iCloud Plus, if I'm not mistaken, this just takes over iCloud. There's no iCloud minus or anything like that. Uh, that private relay, uh, I'm interested if that's just Apple speak for a VPN or if that is something a little bit more sophisticated, almost like a like a Cloudflare 1.1.1 uh, uh, or some sort of DNS, or maybe it's all packaged together. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but I, I really think uh, that, you know, Apple continues to make very meaningful uh, 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 transparency when it comes to, to privacy. You know, they're not just putting up a, a wall for customers and stuff like that. They are you know, uh, giving you some some really meaningful tools, app privacy reports kind of number one uh, for me. Yeah, and I was going to say, they, and again, I don't know if this is a good thing. At Right now, it's a good thing, but Apple is making it really hard for somebody that is really into their ecosystem, especially with stuff like privacy, all these meaningful um, um, ad additions, right? They're making it really hard for me to say, okay, Something happened, I'm fed up, I'm going to pick something else. Where are you going to go, especially if you're concerned about privacy? Where are you going to go to where, you know, whether it be Android, whatever the case may be, where are you, Windows, Microsoft, where are you going to go to where they really said, okay, we're going to, you know, air quotes, but we're going to care about you this much. You know, it's, it's making it even harder for people to get out of the ecosystem. Like I said, I don't know if that's a good thing because of all of the reasons why you don't want to leave privacy, VPN, security, data protection, you know, but if you do decide to leave, you know, where are you going to get, where's the comp for that? And I don't see one. Mm. I, and and that's how like, they get you. <laughs> well, and I feel like the stuff that they announced with their health stuff is very much in that same vein. We're like, this is genuinely useful stuff, but it's almost sets up a way that like, you know, oh, I can't give away, you know, my, my VPN and I, I can't give away, you know, the ability to, to look at, you know, how my parents are doing with their health wise and stuff like that. So I, I, I think that's kind of a, a shadow theme for, for WWDC too. Yeah. Well, don't speaking, leave. speaking of, uh, of health, oh, go ahead, Terrence. No, I was gonna say don't leave or else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll get very sick very quickly. Uh, the health app, uh, definitely wants folks to, uh, keep their Apple watch if they already have one and buy one if they don't, uh, mobility is new, uh, for health metrics, which will measure your walking steady steadiness. Uh, now, we all walk differently, and Apple knows that. The company said used a study of over 1,000 people to measure fall risks. So gathered a lot of data about how someone's 
natural gait may be and how those people differ and how uh, a difference can can potentially lead to something and how that kind of information helps Apple get a little bit smarter about, mm, this might be an issue. You mentioned, Rich, the idea that you can be able to monitor the data of a loved one um, or somebody who trusts you to, to you know, if my... <laughs> No one in my immediate family is is has a fall risk, thank goodness. But if they did, yes, I want to know about it, especially if they're in a compromised position. So a little bit more of that family sharing. New trends will help you not only be able to monitor steps. We're all, you know, the, Apple is not the only company that's good at monitoring how many steps I took during the day. But if it notices, huh, well, you're really pretty consistent on the step front, but something's a little off here, you know, just want to just want to just alert you to that fact that also goes for things like resting heart rate blood glucose level that sort of thing uh, apple also says all health data is encrypted so the whole idea of being able to share with folks that are in your family or friends or your doctor uh shouldn't shouldn't be of of worry uh even though that's often very sensitive information because all health data is encrypted now i don't have an apple watch uh every time apple gets to some cool watch stuff i always compare it to my Fitbit because I'm in the Fitbit ecosystem and, you know, they are mostly neck and neck, a lot of the stuff, but, uh, you know, I can't use fitness plus cause I don't have an Apple watch there. There are definitely a lot of things about health. Every time Apple announces something new, I think they're very long in this game and it is probably only a matter of time till, till I switch over. Yeah, I think especially with what we've learned through the pandemic, I think they, because I think one of the new features is um, respiratory, they're capturing that data in some way. And I think with the trends, it, it gives you the opportunity to see subtle changes. So, you know, you might get sick or something may happen, but it usually isn't something that's just, you know, instant. It's usually something that's gradual. So I think what they're trying to do with trends is just to start to give you kind of a bird's eye level of your health. And then if things start to fluctuate, it lets you know a little bit sooner that, hey, I may need to send this over to my doctor or let my doctor know that something might be a bit amiss. Yeah. Got a few other updates before we get to Mac OS Monterey. Uh, AirPods uh, with UWB now on the Find My Network. Uh, you can add conversation boost for hearing enhancements, support for spatial audio on Apple TV. Siri is also coming to third-party dev devices uh, using the Matter smart home standard, uh, of which Apple is part of. What was Matter called until a couple months ago? Click? Uh, chip. 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 Connected home, <laughs> started... internet, whatever, yeah. Yeah, I knew it started. I knew it started with a C. I, 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 I don't know. Um, I, I guess spatial audio. I think spatial audio is one of those things where once you have it, you go, oh yeah. Now I can't go back. I just don't have it yet. So some, some of this is slightly lost on me. The find my stuff for the AirPods seems huge to me because I, I had a friend who bought some new Pros and like within a week left them in a, when we were still traveling, left them in a cab. Uh, in, in another country. And uh, those were gone forever. And I don't know if this would have helped them in that particular situation, but that solves a huge pain point uh, for a lot of people. All right, let's get into Mac OS Monterey. We got a sneak peek of what's to come. Universal control, uh, controlling access across your iPad, your MacBook Pro, your... Um, your uh, what am I... What can I Yes, thank you, iMac. I'm like, you know, <laughs> desktop. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so all there. And this is just, you know, it's not just, oh, you can use it, you know, you got a you got a second screen. It's the dragging and dropping across across all of them at once. Oh my gosh, when I saw it, I was like, ah, finally. Because I don't, like I said, I don't I don't use an iPad or iPad Pro uh in particular. Uh now at all. Um, but I loved the idea of, oh yes, I can, I can at some point add this to my work setup, but to actually have it as a place that files can go back and forth and it's less of an airdrop slash iCloud slash email to myself type of a situation that I'm doing now. Huge. Uh, and of course Apple made it look seamless, but I think universal control is going to be widely loved. Yeah, yeah, that was absolutely. I was I was that was my favorite part of 
of the whole announcement, I think, because just having the devices in proximity to each other. So it's nothing that you have to connect. It's it. What they showed was extremely seamless. And a lot of times, like you mentioned, if I'm working on something on my iPad, I have to airdrop it to my iMac or to my MacBook or whatever I'm using. And with this, you can actually control your iPad screen with your keyboard or mouse from whatever machine you're using. So you can navigate around an iPad like a laptop. So mm-hmm. I just thought the way that it you can use multi-devices. So they had three different devices you could drag from your iPad all the way across to your iMac. So that was probably one of the slickest things that I I probably saw from the from the announcement. I'm I'm excited about that. Mm-hmm. And there's no setup. You know, right now you can try to do it. We mentioned in you know previous show that there's third party things, there's freeware, even Apple offers their um sidecar i think it's what it's called where you can just do this the mm-hmm. share to different screens that's just screen sharing the fact that you just do it without having to think about it i think is the benefit rich did uh anything in mac os monterey stand out to you are you pumped about uh new uh tab functionality in safari so the one thing that kind of i geeked out a little bit about is that uh they showed off an ar object capture where basically instead of doing a whole 3d model you can use photo Photometry, I'm, that's the wrong word, but basically you use pictures to build, a, 2D pictures to build a 3D object. And I've seen that done with like a like hundred Raspberry Pis to do like 3D imaging of people. But like the fact that you could do it with a fixed object with just your phone, obviously that speaks to a lot of Apple's AR ambitions going forward. Uh, but I think that, that points to a lot of interesting things to make that kind of AR capture a lot easier for developers and just for regular users. Uh, on the developer side, uh, something that that is probably going to be pretty helpful to developers, but also uh, people like me who are in the App Store constantly, custom app listings um, for pages in the App Store that can not only change the um, like so, sort of the app album art depending on who might be viewing the app, so that more people say, "Oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for," but to also highlight events. Um, somebody on Twitter said, yeah, like Travis Scott doing that Fortnite concert, right? Apple, <laughs> that's kind of what we're talking about. That's actually a pretty good, uh, pretty good example. Uh, Xcode cloud access, the limited beta starts today. It's available to all devs in 2022. Uh, we've also got test flight on the Mac, uh, on the developer side, Terrence, did you, uh, did you see anything that a developer friend might say, yes, I've been waiting the whole time for this. But probably just to make it easier for people to eventually get to the point, I think Apple's getting there to where you will eventually be able to make one code, make one app, and it seamlessly work across all devices, iOS and Mac, for the fact that you can actually do it faster using Xcode Cloud Access and Test Flight. You know, just, they're just getting closer and getting closer and getting closer to where we won't have to have all these differentiations. We got Mac OS, and TV OS, and iOS, and watch os eventually it just be like just develop it one time and it works so we're just getting very very closer and yeah, you exactly. can test it you can test your app across the different os's in the cloud so you're not having to you know run your tests you know on each different os and churning and just you know tying up your system all that's done in the cloud it gives you a test report at the end tells you what failed what worked on each different OS. So I think X, you know, Xcode Cloud is going to be extremely, I think the developers are going to love Xcloud code, but Xcode Cloud um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Tongue twister there, but I was really, I was really, you know, um, impressed with what they're doing with Xcode Cloud. We got public betas of iOS 15, iPad OS 15, Mac OS Monterey, TV OS 15, and Watch OS 8 all coming in July. Uh, we will continue some WWDC news on the show during this week. Uh, you know, this is it was a keynote morning, but but the but the the show itself is w- will continue throughout the week, and there'll be there'll be some news coming out. So so look for more news uh, on this show as the week rolls on. But uh, final thoughts uh, from from Terrence and and Nika. You know, what what were you the most excited about from from what you saw today? Was it lackluster? Was it was it better than expected? Uh, it was a lot. It was definitely on brand. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'll 
let somebody else jump in on this. No hardware. I'll just say that and keep it moving. Um, the fact that it was, you know, devoted to software this is WWDC. You know, this is for developers. So they really stayed, like I mentioned, on brand as far as operating systems. No mention of iOS 16. So I think this is just iOS 15 is going to continue for this year unless they spring something up in September. I don't know. Um, but there's one thing that I also thought that was going to be pretty cool, especially for somebody like me that does uh, Apple iOS support, is the uh, screen share in uh, iOS. That will enable you to actually walk through your uh, device with a friend, with a family member, instead of just, like I mentioned in a tweet, closing my eyes while I'm supporting somebody and imagine what their iPhone screen is supposed to look like. Now we can do the screen okay. share and I can say, okay, click this, swipe this, tap that, and I can actually see in real time. So again, that just goes a long way to, like I mentioned before, to where Apple's making it really hard to gather their ecosystem, especially if you have friends and family member who are on the same ship. Yeah, um, again, I, I share that sentiment. It was just so much information. I don't think I've been able to really digest it all. Um, but again, uh, like I said, I was pretty impressed with um, the Universal Control Act uh, across the different devices. I think that was probably the the biggest thing that I, um, you know, got um, out of it. And I think just uh, some of the dev apps that they have coming out are going to be really top notch. So, well, very cool, uh, Rich. What about you? Before before we wrap up this uh, this this Monday edition of WDC 2021 and other news as well, uh, did, what, what was the standout for you? Uh, for me, it was looking at uh, gro FaceTime kind of growing up. You know, there there would always kind of been an open joke when it was first announced that you know Face FaceTime is going to be this open standard and you're going to be able to use it on on other things, and that never ever ever happened and seemed to kind of sit in amber uh, even as they added functionality and to see it kind of with you know, uh, with iOS 15 uh, becoming a legit uh, Zoom competitor, multi-platform, uh, I think that's huge. Well, if you think something is huge from the show and we talked about it, or we may talk about it tomorrow or Wednesday, send us your thoughts. Uh, and if you didn't watch it, you can send us thoughts on anything you'd like us to talk about on a future show as well. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love your emails. Thank you in advance. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Miss Music Teacher, James C. Smith, and Justin Zellers. We also have a brand new boss. Yes, we do. I'm going to try to get your name right. Sardonis Delacroix, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you. Thank you, Sardonis. Maybe it's Sardoni. Either way, I really like your name. Also, thanks to Nika Monfort and Terrence Gaines of the Snob OS podcast. Nika, I'll start with you. Where can people keep up with everything you do? They can pretty much find me on Twitter at Tech Savvy Diva. I'm pretty much on Twitter all the time. And of course, on our podcast, Snob OS. Terrence Gaines, where can people find your work? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook sometimes, I guess, uh, <laughs> at Brother Tech. And like Nika mentioned, I am the second half of the Snob OS show where we record every Wednesday. And we normally come out every Friday with new episodes. So tune us, tune in there. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the show. I know it's a big day for you. Uh, such a pleasure. And <laughs> we'll do it at the next Apple event. Uh, we are also live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we are back tomorrow with guest Trisha Hirschberger. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>